So for this evening, I'd like to introduce the man who is behind the Sunday with Survivors program at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County, and that is Michael Mantell. Michael is a 3G. Two of his grandparents are survivors, and they instilled in him the need to not let their history and the larger history of the Holocaust be forgotten. About nine months ago, Michael contacted us at the Holocaust Memorial and asked about arranging to have a survivor speak to a group of his family just as a private program. And after that program, we had more conversations with Michael and his family, and we realized that this was something that we should arrange on a regular basis and open up to the larger public rather than just have it as a private program. And so our Sundays with Survivor program was launched. And I am grateful for the continued support and interest from Michael and his family, and would like to turn the microphone over to him to introduce our program this evening. Michael? No, uh, everyone able to hear me now? All right. Um, all right, well, uh, thank you, Thorin, and thank you to everyone at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center for everything you do to further the mission of educating young people about the lessons of the Holocaust and for making this monthly Sundays with Survivors program happen. Uh, I also want to say thank you to everyone who's here today as part of this live event and for those of you watching the recording. And a very special thank you to Rosette Prever, uh, Prever Fishman Jerosi for your willingness to share your testimony with us and for giving us a glimpse into your life. Welcome to Sundays with Survivors. The power of the Sundays with Survivors program is that it gives Holocaust survivors the opportunity to share their testimonies with people all over the world. As a 3G, the grandchild of Holocaust survivors and the son of a Sabra, an Israeli, I grew up with stories of the Holocaust. I sometimes joke that when other children's bedtime stories were Hansel and Gretel, my grandmother would tell me about Dr. Mengele. So no wonder why I still have trouble sleeping. I grew up listening to the stories of my grandmother's life before, during, and after the Holocaust. As important as they were to me, I never fully understand, understood the gravity of her stories. After all, she was my little grandmother. I couldn't fathom that she had gone through so much. And on top of that, how she could still smile, laugh, and tell jokes. I sort of still can't wrap my head around it all. And maybe that's a sign of a good thing. In third grade, while my classmates were writing their first books about their pets, family vacations, and even a magic pencil. Uh, at eight years old, I wrote a book called uh, Every Man for Himself, a book about two brothers during the Holocaust. I didn't get all of the details right, but clearly my grandmother's story had a great impact on me at a very young age. Throughout the years, I would ask her questions and even ask her to speak at my classes in high school. And all of these years later, I am so grateful to be part of this endeavor, Sundays with Survivors, in her honor. It is my hope that everyone who attends the Sundays with Survivor program will be touched by these survivor testimonies. My dream is that everyone will care about the Holocaust and heed its lessons. And my request is that everyone who hears Rosette's story and testimony will share it with at least one more person. I am so thankful to all of the survivors who share their testimonies and organizations like the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center for making events like these possible. And again, I wanna thank everyone for being here today and for those viewing the recording. If you, and a very special thank you to Rosette. And if any one of you would like to find out more about the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, uh, to visit the museum, to learn about their other incredible educational programs and events, or if you would like to donate or volunteer, please visit their website at hmtcli.org. 
I thank you so much. And with that, I pass it back to Thorin. Thank you, Michael. Um, today, we'll be hearing, as you heard from Holocaust survivor Rosette Prever Jabosi. Rosette is the mother of one of our board members, Rob Fishman. And as you heard, she, or as you may know, she works with her local Holocaust Center in Naples, Florida, but through the wonders of Zoom, we're able to include her in our programming today. I'll add that I had the pleasure of getting to know Rosette a little bit a few months ago when I did a Curator's Corner program about her family's wall clock that is one of the few items that the family was able to save from, the, from her childhood home in an apartment in Paris and that now stands in our museum. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Oops, let's see if I can, there you go. Um, today, however, you will get to hear directly from Rosette about her experiences. And here, uh, I wanna reiterate just about that the act of hearing testimony is an important one and a privileged one. Um, and when we hear somebody else's testimony, like Michael said, it, it means that we become witnesses too. And we become interested with remembering Rosette's story, and I hope empowered to combat hate, bigotry, anti-Semitism, and intolerance that we come across in our lives today. I will add that I'm sure you know that it's not easy for survivors to share their testimony, and it can be difficult for us to hear as well. And so I ask that during the presentation, you are gentle with yourself, gentle with the other participants in our program, and of course, gentle with our speaker. Rosette is gonna share her testimony for about 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll take questions. So please feel free to type your questions into the, uh, into the chat window, and then either Michael or I will make sure we, uh, we get to them and I, we pose them to Rosette. So with those announcements taken care of, I would like to pass it over to Rosette. You. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, unmute. No, no. You mute yourself. Pushing. I keep clicking. There you go. There you go. Are you okay now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. As you heard, my name is Rosette. Priva Fishman Trabozzi. During the Holocaust, During the Holocaust, I was a hidden child. I was born in Paris, France. My parents, Dora and Shama, as he was called Sam, were young Polish immigrants who came to Paris to seek a better life. My mother was the youngest of three girls. They lived very poorly, received no education whatsoever. Only the boys were sent to school. The girls had to find work at a very early age to help support the family. Since they could not read or write, they had to find some sort of menial work. My mother became a cook for a wealthy family. Her older sister, Suzanne, learned dressmaking, went to Paris to apprentice in some very famous couture houses. She actually worked for Coco Chanel and eventually became quite successful in her trade. She opened up her own business sent for my mother and got her a job as a cook. My father, the youngest of five boys, came to Paris with two of his brothers. The other two emigrated to Chile in South America, where we still have an extensive Priva family. My two uncles in Paris were tailors. My father learned the fur trade. He and my mother were introduced by a mutual family friend. It was love at first sight, so I heard, and they were married shortly after. My brother Bernard was born the following year. My mother helped my father in his fur business, which they started in their small modest apartment. My father would cut the fur pieces and she would operate the machine that sewed them together to make fur coats. They worked diligently side by side, even after my brother was born. They were so determined to succeed. Eight years later, my uncle's wife gave birth to beautiful, identical baby girls. My, must, my mother must have been very envious because lo and behold, I was born 10 months later. From the moment I was born, my mother called me her mazel dikkel kind, since mazel in Yiddish means good luck. 
Her intuition told her that as long as she had me close, no harm would ever come to her or to the family and that I would bring good fortune to all. She kept telling me that and made me feel so special. Surely enough, after my birth, they became quite prosperous. My father's business grew tremendously. He was able to acquire a larger factory, more help and more machinery. They were able to move into a brand new large apartment and furnished it luxuriously. It was in the Marais section of Paris, the fourth arrondissement, which was a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. I can still visualize the beautiful, highly polished oak floors, the dark modern furniture, the newly built bathroom, the paintings, it was all exquisite. There was a clock hanging on the wall of the dining room, my mother's pride and joy. It was about three feet high, made of dark shiny mahogany with a glass front and a pendulum that shined every half hour. I still remember pushing my little dog carriage around and around the large dining room table, waiting for the chimes to sound its beautiful melodious notes. Well, more about the clock later. My mother was an immaculate housekeeper. She would not let anyone in the house until they put on special slippers that she kept at the door. She was an elegant woman, always well-dressed and made up. I can still smell her beautiful fragrance. A gourmet cook, proficient in both French and Jewish cuisine, she entertained the whole family for all holiday dinners. It was considered a big treat to be invited to Dora's home for dinner. She took her cooking very seriously. One day I came home from school, went into the bathroom and found a large fish swimming in our bathtub. When I asked her why there was a fish swimming in the tub, she replied, I don't trust a dead fish. I need to make you filter fish for Passover and I wanna make sure that it's fresh. My father, besides being a smart businessman, was also a skier, rode a motorcycle, loved the outdoors and had a fantastic musical talent. We always had a piano at home, which he played beautifully, as well as the harmonica. He could not read a note of music, it was strictly by ear, but could he make beautiful music? He entertained us for hours. Two of my children luckily inherited his musical genes. They also make beautiful music. And my daughter rides a Harley, just like her grandfather. She is the daredevil of the family. As a matter of fact, she keeps a, a, a picture. She, he was her hero. She keeps a picture of her father and his motor, on his motorcycle in her office at work. I had a charmed life as a little girl in those days. My mother made sure that I had the proper education and polish, which she did not receive. So that by the time I was nine years old, I was immersed in schoolwork, as well as piano, ballet, and even some English lessons. The latter being a symbol of extreme class refinement, according to my mother. My twin cousins and I were very close. I recall my father making us identical fur coats and hats and my aunt sewing identical dresses for the three of us. We would strut around the park in the neighborhood with people pointing to us and shouting, look at the triplets, which was quite a novelty in those days. And we, of course, would laugh to ourselves, but did not deny it. My best friend and schoolmate was named Beth, another Jewish girl. We had a lot in common. We were both quiet, studious girls who loved to play with our dolls. I remember that she had a huge blackboard in her room and we used to take turns playing teacher and student at the class and doing our homework together. I also had a few Catholic friends who invited me to their communions. I was so impressed by the pageantry and beauty of the Catholic church and also how lovely my friends looked in their gorgeous white gowns. And I must, said I, and I must admit also a bit jealous. Our summer vacations were glorious. My parents would send my brother and me to stay with farmers in the countryside for about a month, and then they would join us for another two weeks. We always looked forward to their visit as we had so much fun as a family. One particular summer, I was about seven or eight years old, and it was the night of my birthday in August. I missed my mother so much that I was crying for her. In the middle of the night, I felt something cool next to my cheek something that my mother had placed there. When I woke up in the morning, 
I found the most beautiful porcelain doll I had ever seen, wearing a long blue satin dress, and I loved it from that instant. I immediately declared it to be a boy and named it by my favorite French names, Robert Michel. Well, my second born son is named Robert Michael. He often joked about being named after a doll, but he knows how much that doll meant to, to me and what a comfort it was during some very difficult times. In the summer of 1940, just after the Germans marched into Paris, instead of going to a farm, the whole family, including aunts, uncles, and cousins, went to Biarritz for a vacation. It's a seaside resort situated on the Atlantic side near the border of Spain. This was the first time that I saw Germans who had arrived in trucks. I had heard about these so-called monsters who kill people since my mother's middle sister, who had remained in Poland with her husband and four children, had written us about the terrible situation in Warsaw. My mother sent packages of food and clothing and would receive mail for a while, but when the letters stopped coming, we imagined the worst and we were right. They were later incarcerated in the Warsaw ghetto and never heard from again. These German soldiers in the truck were very young, blue-eyed, smiling, not at all what I was led to believe. They were handsome and about my brother's age. I turned to my mother and said that they didn't look like monsters to me. And she replied, these boys are not the ones to fear. They only follow orders. It's their leaders who are a danger to us. I still could not believe it. At that point, my uncle Jacob, married to my mother's sister, announced that he was not returning to Paris with us. He was petrified of the Germans being Russian, having served in World War I, and having witnessed some atrocities. He decided to go over the border to Spain and somehow tried to reach the United States. He eventually was able to take a ship from Portugal. He told my aunt to return to Paris, close up our business, her business, leave the country as soon as possible and try to join him. It was still possible to leave at that time. He tried to persuade my father to do the same, but my father kept insisting that the French government would protect its Jews, that we should not be alarmed. In other words, he did not believe that we were in danger. So we returned to Paris, and soon after that, our beautiful, serene existence started to crumble. Terrible restrictions were imposed upon the Jews. First, the Jews were not allowed to go out of their houses before nine in the morning or after dark in the evening. We were not allowed to go to public places, such as restaurants, movies, libraries, museums, or assembly groups. I was deeply affected myself because I, was, I had just started taking ballet lessons at the prestigious Châtelet Theater. My dream, like every other little girl of that age, was to become a famous prima ballerina. However, my mother was informed that from that time on, Jewish children were no longer welcome at the school. Jew also were only allowed to shop for food in the afternoon hours when the markets were just about empty or about to close. It became very difficult to obtain food. My mother, being a very resourceful person, had her connections in the black market. She would go to the shoemaker and come out with a chicken or to the dry cleaner for eggs or butter. One day though, when she came back from her daily shopping trip, she burst into tears. She blurted out, all I could get today was some horse meat. Somehow, being the fantastic cook that she was, she made it taste good. The greatest humiliation, though, for us children was to be compared to wear the infamous yellow Jewish Star of David with the word Juif, which means Jew in French, printed across it, and which had to be sewn on every garment. Children from the age of six had to wear it. On the first day that I and other Jewish classmates came to school wearing the star. The headmistress gathered the whole school together in the yard, called us near her, climbed onto the platform and announced that any girl who as much as uttered a single insult or derogatory remark toward us 
regarding, as she put it, this terrible badge that we were forced to wear, that girl would be severely punished. What a brave person she was. She could have been in a lot of trouble. This speech was quite effective within the school walls. The girls were, dis were kind, although distant, as they were probably warned by their parents not to be too friendly with the Jewish girls. However, however, as we left school every day, we had to run as fast as our legs could carry us because the boys of the neighboring school came after us, throwing rocks and calling us dirty Jew dogs and other equivalent insults. I would run crying into my house, angry and screaming at my mother. Why do we have to be Jewish? Why do we have to be different? This was my childish reaction to the situation. But remember that I was just a child and did not understand fully. I just wanted to be like, just like all the other children. My mother tried to soothe me and explain that this was temporary and that every, everything would eventually be well. I was not quite convinced and I do believe that neither was she. Around that time, as soon as my parents heard that they were rounding up all the young Jewish boys to send them to labor camps, they made arrangements for my brother, as well as my cousin, both teenagers, to leave Paris. They devised a unique way to get them out of Paris. My uncle, who was a tailor, sewed two naval uniforms, since uniform young men usually did not have to show papers. I remember my mother sewing money into the hems of their jackets and pairs, she would have stuffed the whole chicken in there if she could have. They got away safely, leaving for Pas Unknown, which was very disturbing. But we got word somehow later on that after they were refused entry into Switzerland, they hooked up with the French forces of the resistance and were fighting the Nazis. And then a series of arrests began. I don't know if any of you has read I've read the book, Sarah's Key, but when I read the book, a light bulb went on in my head. It was in July of 1942, and the Nazis ordered the arrest of thousands of Jewish men, women, and children who were rounded up and kept for days in the Veldiv, a large bicycle arena in Paris. They were held without adequate food or water and terrible sanitary conditions. Finally, they were shipped into concentration camps. I remember that my father told us that we had to leave our home, our apartment, and stay at his factory for the weekend. They always came to your home and late at night, usually to surprise you. I don't know how he knew to hide us. Perhaps he had some inside information from some good hearted policeman. Well, my father also brought some friends, so we had quite a crowd hiding with us. My parents made me feel that we were going to a picnic. My mother passed some delicious food. We slept on blankets. We played games to pass the time away. And I was not at all afraid. We went back to our home, but some others were not so lucky. One evening, we heard a commotion in the apartment right below us. An elderly couple lived there. My mother and Dan would be following her. There were two policemen telling these people to hurry up. My mother, feisty as could be, turned to the policeman and asked why these people were being arrested, what crime they had committed, and cried out in despair that they were old and diabetic and would not survive more than a week without their medicine. The policeman became very angry with my mother for interfering. He turned to her and said, lady, you are not on the list tonight. You know, they had lists, thousand Jews had to be arrested every, every month. You are not on the list tonight. But if you don't shut your mouth in French vernacular, you and your little girl are coming with us. At this point, there was nothing that she could do but retreat back to our home, defeated and very sad. We knew a young couple who lived across the street who were friends of my parents. This is very difficult for me because I still think about it to this day. They had a baby boy, one year old. I love that baby. I used to play with him all the time. When the police came for them, the young mother resisted arrest, created quite a scene, and they shot the baby right in front of their eyes. Another arrest which affected us very personally concerned my aunt and uncle. 
my father's brother, whose son had left with my brother. They paid somebody who promised to get them across the border to the free zone. And that person was called a passeur. That person led them right to the Nazis. They were unfortunately many unscrupulous people who preyed on innocent, desperate victims. And they were some who genuinely helped the Jews. You just have to know who to trust. One day shortly after, as I sat at my desk at school, I noticed that my friend Beth was absent. The teacher burst into tears as she told us that Beth and her family had been arrested the night before. I was sick with grief. When I got home, my father kept reassuring me that we were safe. I trusted him. I never questioned his authority as a child. He seemed to know everything. He was always such a strong figure. I only found out much later on why he was so confident that we were safe from arrest. My brother told me that the Gestapo had visited him at his shop and requisitioned his factory to make fur coats for the German army. They were about to fight on the Russian front and needed some warm coats. He had no choice, of course, but he felt that as long as they needed him, our family would be safe. Shortly after, for some unknown reason, my mother kept me home from school. It seems that the headmistress had contacted her and told her that she had secret address information that the Gestapo was coming to school to pick up all the Jewish children. They did this routinely throughout France. It was toward the end of the school year and I did not go back to school. My parents felt that I should leave Paris for my safety. We had very good Christian friends who lived in our building and who had adopted a little boy. This boy was adopted from their cousin, a poor widow with six children who was a refugee herself from Lorraine, which is right near the German border. She was trying to escape from the Nazi occupation. Her older son had joined the RAF in London and she and the other four children had sought refuge in the free zone of France in the Dordogne area. This boy, according to the agree their agreement, was to spend every summer with his biological family. My mother begged them to take me along for the summer. This would give her time to try to convince my father to plan an escape. Our friend agreed to take me, but it was going to be tricky, and we had to plan my departure without arousing suspicion. Neighbors in those days were always watching you, some very anxious to report the Jews who were breaking the law and thus win points with the Nazis who were the powerful one inside. Since we were not allowed to go out after dark and the train for my departure was in the evening, the plan was for me to pretend that I was mailing a letter at the post office, which was right around the corner of the building. I often did this in view of the neighbors without wearing the Jewish star, of course, and they didn't pay much attention to it because I always came right back. On that particular evening, I was to mail a letter and then run to the tri -state train station, which is a few miles away, wait for the man and his son who were carrying my suitcase and board the train with them. This was probably the most painful moment of my life because I had to say goodbye to my parents, not knowing when or if I would ever see them again. I pleaded with them to come with me. My father said that he could not leave. I then asked my mother to come with me. She told me that she could not leave my father, but reassured me that they were planning to join me very soon. My mother hugged me for a long time and then uttered the words that have been with me all my life. She said them half in French, half in Yiddish, and me keep my to kind, and me keep my maison. There goes my beloved child. There goes my good luck. We boarded the train and we had one more hurdle to surmount. We had to cross the border into the free zone of France. The Vichy government had made a deal with the Nazis that part of France toward the south would remain free of occupation. But eventually the Nazis marched right through ignoring the pact. At the border, two officers came on board, one French and one German and asked to see the man's papers. He had told us to be very quiet and so we obeyed. We knew that this was very dangerous. 
His children had no papers. He examined the man's papers, asked him who these children were and where we were going. The man answered without hesitation that we were his son and daughter, that we were going to visit relatives in the South. They looked us up and down for a very long time as we kept a very straight face and finally left the camp. We had lucked out. What a courageous man he was. If he had been found out transporting a Jewish child across the border, he would have been arrested or worse. We arrived in Piegu in the Dordogne, a quaint little village in a rural community with a real castle on top of the hill. It was old and in ruins, but it still had a dungeon, which was quite a playground for the, all the children in the village. The family lived on the main street in the storefront, which considered of one large room, kitchen, and back room. There was an outhouse or a shack with a hole in the ground, which was a far cry from the luxurious bathroom we had in Paris. The conditions were very primitive. We had to wash in the kitchen, which we, didn't, we did not do too often. The girls had the front room and Madame slept in the back with her two sons. She was a kindly looking lady dressed in black as she was still in, in mourning and had premature gray hair, which she wore in a bun. She looked very sad, but she did smile a lot at her little boy who had returned to her. They were two older girls who were very friendly to me, plus one teenage boy and a beautiful redheaded girl my age who developed quite an attitude when she saw me. She probably resented me for taking up much of the attention. We never really got close, just barely tolerated each other. They fed me well. I never went hungry. I was never too clean, but never wanting for food. I still remember the wonderful rabbit stew that Madame made. We ate a lot of rabbit as it was cheap and readily available. They immediately took me to the church where the priest told me how welcome I was. He declared himself to be my protector, told me that I could sing in the choir and to pick out a saint for whom I would bring flowers. What does a little Jewish girl know about saints? I picked Joan of Arc because that was the only one I knew and I considered her to be brave and strong. I would pick flowers from the field and place them at the foot of her statue. I sang in the choir, but could not take communion because I was not baptized. The mayor's daughter befriended me immediately. I was quite a novelty in this town. She looked me up and down, up and down and said, I've never met a Jew before, but you don't look any different. I then became the town mascot. Three weeks after my arrival, I received a large package containing my winter clothes, books, favorite toys, and my beloved doll. There was a letter from the man who had brought me in which he told me that my father could not write since he had broken his arm and that my parents had to go into hiding because conditions in Paris had become very dangerous. I would not hear from them for a while, but he urged me to be brave and patient and that I would get some news soon. Needless to say, that was quite a shock to me. I was very upset as much as everyone tried to comfort me, even the redhead was nice for once. I felt so alone and deserted without my family. The only comfort I had was to hug my doll and imagine that my mom was holding me tight. I could even smell her perfume and I have a sneaking suspicion that she had saturated that doll with her perfume. I realized that I would stay in Piedu for a while, so I tried to adapt to the life. I became a real little peasant girl. I wore clogs. I learned to walk through the woods and pick mushrooms. I climbed up trees and picked cherries and apples. I learned to ride on my friend's bike. I played with snails and frogs. I learned to knit and went to church with the others. I prayed to God. I believed it was the same God and asked him to keep my parents and brother safe. Luckily, my brother found out where I was and managed to visit me in Piegu. He went through hell and fire, as he said, but he felt that he had to visit his little sister. As soon as the priest saw my brother, he told him that I should be baptized in order to keep me safe. My brother told him that I was Jewish and that my parents would want me to stay Jewish. My brother visited me three times during my stay and the priest approached him each time with the same request. I really believe that he was determined to save my soul. 
I was enrolled in the secular school. It was one large classroom comprised of several grades. I was in the advanced grades and the headmistress was my teacher. She loved me as I was a very good student. And she was also very protective as she knew of my circumstances. One day, as I was sitting at my desk near the window, I noticed a number of men in the yard dressed in dark clothing and carrying guns. My teacher ran out to speak to them. I asked her who these men were when she came back and she replied, oh, they're just friends of mine and changed the subject. Well, I did find out later that she was one of the heads of the French resistance, which was quite prevalent in our region. Actually, most people in the village were involved in the resistance. We often heard American planes wrapping supplies in the fields and we would cheer. We had a very close call one day. There was a village not too far from ours named Oradur sur Lan. This is documented in the history books where a German officer had been killed by a resistance fighter. In retaliation, the Nazis shot all the men in the public square, gathered all the women and children in the church and set it on fire. There were no survivors. That same regiment of Nazis was now marching towards our town and we gathered they were still angry. Our resistance fighters went from door to door, told us to pack a bag and food, a bag and food and blanket and head for the woods where they would try to protect us. We spent the night in the woods. In the morning, we were told that the Nazis had changed their course and were headed in another direction. Lucky once more. We also witnessed events that no children should ever see. We witnessed the execution, the execution of traitors. We knew that these were held in a cemetery. We would climb up the wall even though we were not allowed. And we would watch as they shot the traitors who had betrayed their own comrades. Every time one was shot, we would shout with joy. This is hard to believe, but we even saw a father, one of the farmers of the area, order the execution of his own son who had betrayed a friend to the Nazis. That's how patriotic some of the French people were. We're not talking about the government, though. talking about the French people. Liberation finally came and the whole village celebrated in the streets. I anxiously awaited some news of my parents, expecting them to come for me at any time. A couple of months later, my brother arrived. He could not get away sooner because after liberation, he had been put in charge of a German prisoner camp. In his charge were many Nazi officers. And though he said he never mistreated them, he told me of one incident where we told the officer to remove his beautiful leather boots. My brother tried them on and said, they fit perfectly, I will keep them. And I also want you to know that I am a Jew. What sweet justice that was. He had his own very interesting story to tell. Uh, on an added note, I asked my brother how he communicated with the Germans. I said, you didn't speak, you didn't speak German. He said, I spoke Yiddish and they understood me. Upon his arrival, my brother sat me down and told me the sad news. My parents were never in hiding. They were arrested two weeks after I left Paris, were taken to, Trans to Drancy, the French internment camp, and 10 days later sent to Auschwitz. After witnessing my emotional reaction, he told me that we were going back to Paris to stay with my one remaining uncle, aunt, and cousins who had escaped by hiding in a convent. He told me that many people were returning from the camps. They were called displaced persons or DPs and that we might be lucky and find them. So we went back to Paris and went to live with my aunt and uncle. Their apartment had not been taken. We, on the other hand, had lost everything. Our apartment and furnishings were all taken away as well as my father's business. We had nothing left except for some money, some jewelry and photos that my parents had given our neighbors for safekeeping. We did recover one precious item. We heard that all the pianos taken from the Jews were held in a warehouse as they had no time to ship, it, ship them to Germany. If you could identify your piano with proof, you could get it back. My aunt and cousins and I proceeded to the warehouse. We looked around and saw hundreds of those beautiful pianos 
Some looked very expensive, large grand, ornate, gilded. It was a dazzling sight. Out of the corner of my eye, I spotted this small upright piano. I ran over to it, started to play and screamed out, this is my piano. The man in charge said, are you sure? I replied that I was quite sure, since this had the same chipped ivory note and it sounded just like mine. He asked me if I had any papers for proof. I then told him that they had taken everything away from our home. How could I possibly prove it? I pointed out to him that I did not pick up one of the expensive pianos. I just wanted what was mine. He finally said that he believed me and I could have, that I could have it. My cousins and I were thrilled. They had never played the piano before, but they started taking lessons and it was evident that they had also inherited the musical talent. Every day on my way to and from school, I would pass truckloads of DPs returning from the camps. I would run home in anticipation, hoping to find that my parents had returned. I even went to the famous Rothschild synagogue, which was down the street from our apartment and prayed to God, begging for my parents' return. Unfortunately, my prayers were never answered. I had to resign myself to the fact that they had perished at Auschwitz. One day, my brother went to our old apartment building to find out if they were any news. There was a telegram for my aunt and uncle in America who wanted to know who was alive. He immediately responded that he and I were alive and living in Paris. My uncle wrote and said that they were the first in line at the American consulate to try to get us a visa to the United States. Soon after, we started receiving packages filled with all the wonderful American goods that we were so lucky. Since my aunt and uncle wanted us to come to the States, we had to make a decision. My relatives and friends were so more than happy to have a stay with them. Actually, my brother was already employed and self-sufficient, but my aunt and friend said that they would keep me and educate me and that I would be their third daughter. I know that she loved me very much. My brother and I felt that we belonged with my aunt in America. She had no children. I remember years back when she told my mother that she couldn't have children. My mother replied, my children are your children. Another prophecy that came true. My aunt had lost her entire family. We were the only ones left, so we decided that we would go to America. It took some months, but the papers family came. I believe that I was given some priority because I was an orphan. I was to be examined by an American doctor who found me in perfect health. Then I was summoned to the American consulate where I was interviewed at length by an American, important looking official who examined my school papers, teacher recommendations, report cards, etc. He finally left his desk came over to me, gave me a great big kiss on both cheeks and said, Rosette, I am proud to say, welcome to the United States of America. You may arrange passage whenever you wish. It was a different story with my brother. He had just turned 21 and the French government wanted him to serve in the French army. He argued that he had just served with the French forces of the resistance for the past few years. It took another year for them to accept that as a legitimate service. But he finally, he finally made it a year later. My brother took me to Le Havre, where I boarded a merchant marine ship. There were quite a few Jewish immigrants on board. I was the only orphan and I was entrusted to the captain who watched over me and made sure that I did not get seasick. It was a rough voyage, but every morning he would pick me up from the cabin that I shared with five other women, took me by the hand and walked the deck with me. He said that was the only way to fight seasickness, and he was right. I never got sick, all the other people did. We arrived in New York two weeks later. Passing the Statue of Liberty was quite a beautiful sight. After we docked and I went down the plank, I saw my aunt and uncle who was screaming with joy. It was quite an emotional moment. Thus began my wonderful journey in America. It was April 19, 1946. I was 13 and a half years old. I had left France as a little French girl with sad memories. I was now a budding American teenager. My aunt found me an English tutor, a retired high school principal, who upon hearing my story would not charge us. After studying with him the whole summer, I entered Erasmus, I entered Erasmus Hall High School in Brooklyn and even got an A in English. 
1947, one year later, my brother arrived. As he walked off the ship, he was clearly a large object in his arms, wrapped in a blanket. It was the clock. I have no recollection of how he was able to recover it. Perhaps it was hidden at a neighbor's house. To me, it was a marvelous miracle. After having graced the home of my aunt, my brother, and my sons, we donated it to the Holocaust Intolerance Center in Glencoe, New York, where my son is a board member. It will be half, so I hear, in a room dedicated to the furnishings of Holocaust victims, complete with pictures and family history, and that makes me very happy. I made many friends, went to parties, dated, much to my uncle's chagrin, as he was very, very protective. I attended Brooklyn College, married, and had a beautiful family, two sons and a daughter. I am now blessed with six fabulous grandchildren and grandchildren-in-law, some about to be married, some married, as well as my husband Peter's large, wonderful Italian family. My mother was right. My muzzle still prevails. I am here to relate my tale. I sometimes shiver at the thought that I had, had I been in Paris another two weeks, I would have been arrested with my parents. They saved my life. That is the reason that I became a docent at the Holocaust Museum in Naples, not only as a tribute to my parents, but also to educate people, especially young students, about the sad but fascinating part of World War II history. This is especially important because they are the last generation who will see and hear a survivor who was a witness to the horrors of the Holocaust. Sadly, my beloved brother Bernard passed away a year and a half ago. He was my dear brother. He took care of me. He was my hero and he will be forever engraved in my heart. At this point, whenever I address groups of school children, I always like to leave them with this threefold message. First, value your family. You don't realize how much they mean to you until they are no longer with you. Second, appreciate the wonderful freedoms that you have in this great country, free of persecution, free to speak up for your rights and the rights of others. And third, as I gaze upon their beautiful multiracial faces, respect your differences as well as your cultural diversities. We are all different, color, religion, gender, we are, but we are all of one race, and that is the glorious human race. I have devoted myself to promote tolerance and fight bigotry in any way that I can. If my story has touched your hearts, that I have accomplished my mission. Thank you. Thank you, Rosette. Um, it's an amazing story and, and you present it so, so powerfully. Thank you for sharing it with us. You're very, very welcome. It's my pleasure to do so. It is my duty to do so. I wanna again invite people to submit questions to Rosette just by typing them into the chat window. And uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Michael to lead us off on some of those questions. Uh, Michael, do you wanna start with us? Yeah, thank you. And uh, Rosette, thank you so much again for, for sharing your testimony and for uh, Rob, for Robert, for, for you uh, bringing all of this together as well. This was truly remarkable. Um, and I love the values and the lessons that you share when you, th those three values that you share at the end of your uh, testimony when you, when you uh, do this with young people, but I think it resonates with all of us of all ages. Yes. Uh, and I think it's wonderful that you have family and friends on this, uh, on this Zoom as well. It just, it makes this so much more meaningful. Um, speaking of doing your, um, uh, it, it, having your testimony in, in schools, when did you start uh, sharing your testimony? I mean, it sounds like you perfected for many this. years, for quite a few years, many years. I joined the Holocaust Museum about 18 years ago, and I've been going to schools all over the area, or they come to us. It depends. If they're too young, we go to them. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, I've spoken to many, many school children. I have a lot of beautiful letters of appreciation for these children. And uh, it's, it's been my pleasure to do so. 
and to give them some inspiration, which I hope I have inspired all these young people to uh, go on and carry, carry this message. I once had a little boy, this is one story I will tell you, a 12 year old little Latino boy. At the end, I've spoke to about three or 400 of these, these the children in their, in their auditorium. At the end, he came over to me and said, Miss Rosette, could I have a copy of your speech? Because I want to make sure that my children and my grandchildren hear about this. I was so touched. But yeah. this is what I hope to inspire. And you do, you do. And I'm so thankful that we're able to have this recorded and to share it with others. As I said in the beginning, this is the most important thing is that we don't just uh, listen to a testimony today, but we become uh, surrogate survivors and we share your testimony with others. So I love that this also came from such a young man as well. Uh, I also wanna open up the floor if anyone else has any questions, but uh, I just wanted to, uh, also ask one more, um, uh, a lesson that you would leave with us as well from, from growing up at such a young age and, and witnessing this and then being in, in the United States and saying that it was this beacon uh, of hope for you and, um, and from that, what we can learn as well. What do you want me to say? Well, I am certainly grateful to, to be have been in America all these years and to have this wonderful family and friends. And uh, uh, I'm just grateful to be here and to appreciate what this country has to offer and uh, not to take it lightly. And we also have to be on lookout and, and be very vigilant about what's going on in this world today. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, it's, it's, a, it's a scary world. Yeah. We have to be ever so vigilant. Thank you. Yeah, vigilance and um, also, and, as and, you said, gratitude. And that's why people have to be educated. I think education is 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 the only way to do it because it's only ignorance that 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 uh, that is at the root of all this. If you're ignorant, you don't know what's going on, and you uh, you listen to all the lies that are going around the world today. Thank you. And I just want to share one, also one message from, from somebody who, who wrote, thank you so much for sharing your touching and important story. Uh, I am honored to, to have heard your story and God bless you. And I think we can all agree with that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, this is, truly means the world. And, uh, and Thorin, I just want to uh, pass this back to you uh, if you have any additional uh, final thoughts. And thank you again, everyone. Well, I see. Oops, yeah, I see that some somebody typed in a question asking if you ever nominated the woman that uh, saved you or helped you in in Vichy well, for for unfortunately, yeah. For right unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, I was very young when I left. I was what eleven years old. Um, I did not. I forgot their names, and they went back to Lorraine. They went back to where they came from, and we completely lost touch with them. And you know, at that time, you know, all I wanted to do was to forget, really. I really blacked out a lot of these episodes and uh, I blacked out names. I remember certain names and I forget, I just forget most of them. I remember, I think her name was Madame Blanche, but I'm not quite sure. I think some of the girls' name was Francoise and Jacqueline, but I'm not quite sure, you know what I mean? I was, I was young. And I blacked out certain things. I really did, and I think it's typical of of uh, of children who go through the trauma that I did. Yeah, I know you said that you started telling your testimony about eighteen years ago, but it did make me wonder about how you treated this memory and your history when you first came here, and as you were growing up as a high school student. I can't imagine that this was a part of your story that, and your history that you would share so readily as a, as a high school girl in America. No. It took me two years. First of all, there was a group called The Hidden Child and they met in New York and I, I, they had a big roundup in uh, uh, Madison Square Garden and I was all set to go and I couldn't bring myself to go. And then when I moved to Naples, the museum was open for a couple of years and I drove back and forth back 
back and forth, back and forth. And I would not, I could not bring myself to go in because I didn't want to, to recall these memories. It was too painful. Uh, Robert can tell you that he didn't know anything. He didn't know much about what happened to me. Uh, he knew that my parents had been killed, of course, but he didn't know anything until he read a paper that I wrote for Hadassah, a, a little a bio, a short bio. And he was very surprised to hear about it. But finally, when I finally sealed myself up and I said, you have to go into the museum. And I finally went in and the director was there and another woman was there and they wouldn't let me, literally tied me down. They wouldn't let me go. They said, you cannot leave. You've got to stay with us and work with us which I did, and I'm so happy that I did that. And the same thing happened with a friend of mine, another French woman who heard my story. She said, I wanna get in touch because I, I heard her name is Renee Petouk. She was from France as well. And she said, I heard your story. I have the same exact same story. I said, you have to come. She said, I can't do it. I said, you have to, you have to swallow hard, but you have to do it. And she did, and now she's also as active as I am with the museum. So. You just have to seal yourself and, uh, be, and, be, and be strong. It hurts in the beginning. It's very painful. For sure. Yeah. I, I it still wondered, hurts when I... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I, I wondered if you would speak at all about your sense of the way the Holocaust is remembered. And particularly, my sense is that much more of the focus today, when people think about the Holocaust, they think about events in Poland. They think about events in Germany and less so about France. And I, I wondered if that's the way you sense the general public's awareness or, or what role or how does France fit into your general sense of what the public knows about the Holocaust? I don't know much about what's going on in France because I'm not really in touch with my relatives there. A few, my I cousins- just mean like the people you speak to, do they, do they know that the Holocaust took place in France? Or did they think of it as something- Well, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, uh, children here do not. That's why they have to be educated. Uh, they don't. A lot of people don't. It's true. The younger people don't even know what the Holocaust is. You no, know, we have to remind. We have to. <laughs> they they have to go to school and learn about it. And some and some of the schools don't even teach it. They do in Florida, but they do it in most in most states. I think they're only about six or seven states. Is am I right? You teach it. And, and I know it's very mandated. different across different states. There's right. different mandates. Yeah. Exactly. But you know, some of my relatives in France have been completely assimilated. They married, they went to married, and they don't. Uh, they even became Catholic. They don't. Uh, they, I think they're afraid. They're afraid of what's going on. Yeah. I I know that we need to finish shortly, but I I know that you also did travel back, and I think Rob put it in one of the in the chat yes. that you traveled back to France uh, a few years ago and went back to some of the places, like found where your your family's apartment was. Can you tell us a little about that trip and um, why you did it and what it brought out for you? Well, the children wanted to, it was two of my children and two of my grandchildren who accompanied us. And it was quite a memorable trip. They wanted to find their roots. So they wanted to see where I lived. I don't know, if we don't have a, a picture of the building where, uh, where I lived. It was a, be it's a beautiful building, be still beautiful in the Marais section which is still beautiful, very chic at this point, very chic uh, neighborhood. They went to the school. We went to the park where I used to walk by, by dark carriage as, as a little girl, where uh, it's the Place des Vosges, where Victor Hugo's birthplace actually. And uh, then we went to the, to the uh, uh, Holocaust Museum where they saw my parents, my parents' names were up on the wall. They lit a candle. My, they lit a candle and, and Robert said, said the uh, prayer for the dead. And that was very touching, yes. Uh, it was quite a memorable trip. And I think the children, I don't know, Robert could speak. Robert, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Can you talk uh, about it? What, what yeah, was yeah. your impression of, of, yeah, of our uh, trip back? It was back in 2014, so we did this trip. It was myself, my sister, and each of our oldest kids went back with mom to see where she lived. It was her place of birth. It was on uh, uh, the street that she lived on prior to her, her folks uh, being arrested and where she lived. We walked around the neighborhood. Uh, I did put up a post uh, of a YouTube link. that's an eight minute video that we did. that's sort of like a summation of the trip and what it was like. But being back in Paris was just incredible for us to experience. And 
Um, first of all, you know, growing up with mom and, and her reluctance to talk about the experience for me, it never was really discussed. And it wasn't until that it was in that article and Hadassah was like, well, I knew that your parents didn't survive, but I really didn't know the full extent of your story because you didn't really share it that much. And now you're full steam ahead with your story. Very compelling. But the, uh, the last part of that was that uh, my wife, Lisa, uh, and I had a chance to go back to Israel uh, that later the following year. And we had a chance to say Kaddish at Yad Vashem for mom's parents. Uh, that was a very meaningful thing for me to be able to do that. Uh, but anyway, it's an eight minute video I put up there for you guys. If you want to take it, click on it and look at it. So uh, very meaningful trip for us. I'll never forget it. Thank you, Rob. I, I want to bring us to a close and once again, extend my thanks to you, Rosette, to Michael, uh, to Rob, and to all of you for watching. And again, encourage you to carry forward the messages that Rosette shared with us. Thank you so much. And I wish Thank everybody you. a lovely evening. Thank you for being such a wonderful uh, audience. <laughs> I love you all. Thank you. Fantastic. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.